Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Jaspreet Kaur. I'm an architecture graduate and the co-author of the research paper, Translation and Continuity of Tradition, an ongoing dialogue in Aotearoa. This research paper attempts to pay tribute to the journey and spirit of adventure that brought people to Aotearoa and has shaped its architecture. It observes our architecture evolution and begins a discussion around the current state of knowledge by studying the history and architectural tradition which is manifested within the built environment. I'd like to begin by introducing my part of the world as it may be new to you. This cluster of islands encircled on the world map is known as New Zealand. Aotearoa is its indigenous name. Both names are actively used in the paper and in this presentation with respect to New Zealand's bicultural heritage. Aotearoa didn't exist in the Western history until its discovery in 1642 by Dutch explorer Emil Tasman. He named it New Zealand after a place called Zeelandia in the Netherlands. Its discovery encouraged subsequent explorations from many nations. And ultimately, this land was claimed in the name of Her Majesty Queen Victoria of England in 1840. The very first inhabitants of New Zealand were birds. Most of them are still a part of our everyday life. The first human contact with these islands took place in the mid 1200s by oceanic people descending from a place called Hawaiki. They named it Aotearoa which means land of long white clouds on account of large white clouds found hovering over the landmass. They arrived on what is known as a waka, which is a timber carved um, canoe. Aotearoa's early architecture responds to the relation between the waka, the canoe, and the whare, which means dwelling wherein the upturning of one is claimed to be the origin of the other. In the Samoan version of the story, the whare was built first, whereas in the Tongan version of the story, the waka was built first. It was then turned upside down and placed on poles to be used as a shelter. There is a little debate for what came first. However, we can agree that the construction methods, the skills and the decorations of these two fundamental artifacts are connected. This relationship is demonstrated by a shared tradition of ornamental carving and customs associated with the construction and use of both waka and whare. Indigenous oral records tell us that several fleets of canoes journeyed to Aotearoa between 1200 and 1300 AD from Polynesia. Early accounts report some permanent dwellings whose inhabitants often moved from one place to another in search of food. Around 1580, we started to see Pa. A Pa is a fortified tribal village established for communal living. They occupied high ground and employed trenches and fortifications in order to protect the inhabitants from intertribal warfare. Key typologies of this particular time period um, are on the screen right now. On the left, we have the Farepuni, which is a communal sleeping house. And on the right, we have the Pataka, which is an elevated storehouse, highly ornamented um, storehouses. So a Farepuni, as it says, is a communal sleeping or resting space. It's a gabled rectilinear form with a porch to shelter the openings, and it has large roof overhangs to protect its walls from um, rainwater. Pataka is a communal storehouse used to store all sorts of goods, really. Um, it is elevated, it is meticulously ornated, and it communicates a tribe's prestige to its neighbours. Construction of both of these um, typologies employs timber. It is post and lintel construction with thatch roofs and woven flax internal um, finishings. As mentioned earlier, New Zealand was discovered in the Western world in 1642, and after many visits and explorations, a treaty was signed between Māori Rangatira, which means um, the chiefs of the Māori um, tribes, of indigenous tribes of Aotearoa, and the representatives of the British Crown in 1840 as an agreement of coexistence. This treaty is known as the Treaty of Waitangi. 
It is New Zealand's founding document that takes its name from the place in the Bay of Islands where it was first signed on 6th February 1840. While we are focusing on architecture more specifically, it has to be acknowledged that colonization is an ongoing battle that has had a negative impact on generations and has left many people feeling lost and alone in their own country. For the purpose of this paper, we wanted to make sure that Maori architecture is represented appropriately, which is why um, we engaged actively in consultations with our Maori colleagues. This information um, regarding the treaty um, in our paper is very, very brief and it is intended as such. This is because the complexity of the treaty, subsequent land confiscations, New Zealand land wars, and the atrocities endured by Maori during this time demands and deserves a thorough discussion, which is unfortunately outside the scope of this paper. However, um, it is important in the discussion of New Zealand's architecture to address an event as significant as a treaty because it bears heavily upon how society was formed and how architecture continued to evolve from this point forward. Um, so New Zealand's architecture can't be discussed holistically without knowledge of the treaty. Um, and now I want to share with you two main um, impacts, large impacts that we see in the architectural world. So first of all, on your screen, you can now see two typologies of Whare Nui and Ahakari. So firstly, at this point in time after the treaty, um, the indigenous people of Aotearoa started to see themselves as one body that was native to the land. So prior to that, they existed as tribes with um, with uh, diverse opinions and and communal living um, communal living expectations and societies and so on. So there there is quite a bit of diversity of uh, of indigenous uh, people within within the country before Europeans arrived. Um, and that event caused them to see themselves as one body that was native to the land. And that's when we first hear the term Māori being used to address those that are indigenous to the land and the word Pākehā being used um, as a reference to the Europeans because the newcomers were predominantly European. These two identities and the beginning of a bicultural society was forged at, at the time of the treaty. With that, we see development of now Māori architecture. Small steps is first, incorporating new materials such as weatherboards and flashings and construction of their whare. Um, but slowly, they started to make bigger moves. So on the screen, we have a whare nui, which is a meeting house. This is an archetype designed for intertribal meetings. This is a, a political and communal typology of architecture specifically designed for tribes to organize um, a council to be able to gather as a council and discuss important issues of the present moment, such as the effects of the treaty um, and land confiscations and so on. Um, on the right side, we have Hakari. Hakari means a feasting stage, and these are these were built to support meetings um, and large gatherings. So these are feasting stages. This is where the gathering would be fed. Um, these will be constructed by the hosting tribe. Um, and it communicated the, the mana, the prestige, um, and position, the power of, of the hosting tribe. So the more powerful they were, the more elaborate and, and taller and bigger um, these stages would be. Unfortunately, none of them have survived because they were a temporary archetype and would be disassembled after their use. The second big impact that we see in terms of architecture is in the built environment. So after the Treaty of Waitangi was signed, the built environment itself started to grow exponentially. And we begin to see English and European architectural traditions being uh, imported out of Europe and then incorporated into the New Zealand landscape and also being adapted into the New Zealand landscape. So with that, we start to see regional characteristics of pre-existing typologies such as the villa or the English cottage. 
um, in this image on your screen, I am sharing the New Zealand landscape itself. You can see tents and ships, steam, steamboats in the in the image. So newcomers that were coming in to settle the New Zealand colony would spend their first um, sometimes maybe a number of months, but sometimes even the first year or so in either tents or temporary dwellings um, um, that were constructed out of timber and canvas. Um, in the corner, in the left um, hand corner, you see an English cottage. So this would be, um, again, it's demonstrating the new, new typology, the new architecture tradition, which is of the English, um, uh, English style. Um, but another story here is that these would be prefabricated homes that were brought over by by the settlers as part of their luggage. So in London, they had establishments that were providing prefabricated homes and furniture to settlers that they could take with them um, and assemble upon arrival. So on this slide is a very, very quick overview of the vernacular architecture. So introduced typologies at this point, taking in regional, um, sorry, introduced typologies that are adapting to new environment and are starting to show regional characteristics. So we see English cottages up in the corner. A variety of architectural styles were explored at this time, including the Georgian Villa, Victorian Villa, Renaissance Revival, Gothic Revival, Queen Anne, Edwardian Villa, and so on. Basically, uh, whatever style was popular in, in England would be brought over at the same time. And we will have our own version of, of the uh, Victorian Villa, for example, happening in New Zealand. So usually the New Zealand uh, models were would be smaller um, and they would incorporate a porch or a veranda. Um, which which helps uh, deal with our climatic conditions, which are very specific. And that particular element, architectural element, can also be seen in the fray. Um, while the dominant colonial architecture was British in style, other nationalities were also present in the country at this time, namely the Welsh, the Danes, Irish, Bohemian, uh, Germans, French, Spanish, Indian, and Chinese. And their presence contributed to the social culture, economy, and urban ecology of New Zealand's cities and the stylistic character characteristics of the New Zealand villa. So again, on your screen, you can see several different styles, but you can also see combinations of those styles. Um, for example, in the uh, top right-hand side corner, that particular villa is, is a combination of Victorian characteristics and Indian Tourette's. Moving on from that train of thought, um, this growth and diversity of architecture styles continues on as the demographic becomes more and more multicultural. So now we're starting to see um, in the post-war period, American architectural trends, uh, as well as modernism um, being incorporated into the New Zealand landscape. In post-war New Zealand, a multicultural identity begins to be argued by those emigrating to and seeking refuge in Aotearoa after the war. Um, the built environment responds to this appropriately as emigre architects, artists, and designers begin to explore their own respective styles as guided by modernism, expressionism, and brutalism, while playing close attention to the natural context of their new place. So now we're starting to see at this time bungalows and art deco and modernism and so on. And again, on this slide, in the bottom left hand side, you can see an art deco uh, villa being constructed using timber weatherboards, which is a very uh, New Zealand adaptation of that particular typology. And as you would know, art deco doesn't traditionally exist with that material, but in New Zealand it does. So multiculturalism, diversity of people, diversity of um, species in general is is not something new when when you look at New Zealand as as a place that didn't have any humans we had a diversity of in the bird population um, when we started to have, see our first human beginnings um, we we saw diversity of of um, uh, social characters and communal um, uh, communal beliefs and so on within those people. So in, in the map 
the central map on your screen is a cultural map and it, it shows the diversity of regional uh, provinces, areas that are dictated by the diversity of the Iwi. Iwi means tribes. So these are the indigenous tribes of, um, of New Zealand, New Zealand's um, Maori population. And you can see that there is many, many, many types, uh, many, many, many um, people within the Maori population that, that are quite diverse. And at the far right side of your screen, you can see a diversity map of Auckland City, which is demonstrating um, the diversity of the city itself uh, using color. And uh, different colors are associated here with um, the wider communities found in the city. For example, European is, is a wider community. Um, Asian is a wider community. But as you can see on that map, it's quite colorful. It's got a good blend of, of all those colors, which shows us that there is actually a very good mix of those wider communities uh, within Auckland City. And when you break down those wider communities further, you'll find that it's actually more diverse than it looks on the screen. There is a significant amount of diversity of culture, technology and architectural practices that were brought to New Zealand through the process of settling a new colony and by subsequent migrations. This research paper observes that with migratory history and a history of colonization as a heritage, the people of Aotearoa expressed three identities, indigenous, colonial and migrant, all of which informs our built environment and all of them claim appropriate representation within it. So with all that in mind, what is the architectural tradition of New Zealand and what is the current generation inheriting? Um, on your screen, you can see some bullet points to that question. So my research has shown that in terms of indigenous tradition, we're looking at communal living, ethical use of materials, um, minimal impact on the environment, narratives embedded in the landscape, myth and legend, story of triumph, um, story of discovery, reflected in place names and carvings. Timber is a dominant building material and the rectilinear gabled forms with porches and small openings are a um, predominant typology. Um, but as we see colonial tradition sort of coming in, we see establishment of uh, connections with the homeland. So importing again pre pre-existing ideas of of, um, of a dwelling um, that they had had in their homeland, but they're bringing it over and they're adapting it to the New Zealand context. Um, and we start to see, as I said before, we start to see regional characteristics within those styles. We see bicultural architecture, hybrid archetypes such as Ronco houses um, or weatherboards and metal joinery being incorporated in whare design. Gabled rectilinear form and the veranda is still quite popular. Timber predominates our industry, um, but we are starting to see larger openings and indoor fireplaces, which is something we didn't see with, in, with indigenous architecture. Post-war period brings modernism and even more international influence um, into the country and it forces us to keep up with the latest trends in technology and at the same time um, also keeps keeps our tradition of adapting to our context alive. Translation and continuity of tradition and ongoing dialogue in Aotearoa. In this paper, the second half of our paper shares stud case studies of contemporary projects that incorporate traditional knowledge, design philosophies and building practices while providing the needs of a modern society by using modern technology and materials, understanding the needs of the present moment and fostering relationships between the past and the present. They are reviving tradition in some cases and or are allowing it to evolve and continue on into the future in other cases. So that's where we get our terms translation and continuity of tradition. So the first case study you'll see in the paper is um, uh, this one. This um, image contains two buildings. Both of them are worthy of, of recognition and further study. On the left is Pukinga. On the right is Nako Mahaki. We are more interested in Nako Mahaki because this is a Whare Nui, a traditional Whare Nui being revived after 100 years um, since the last one was built. Um, and, and in this particular example, 
they are using a traditional typology. It is twice as big in scale than, they, than the biggest one that they had uh, previously built. This one is built using a combination of traditional and modern techniques and materials. The carvings inside of, of this Whadanui um, share a multicultural narrative of Auckland City itself and represents the demographic um, appropriately. There is much, much more to be said about this building, um, which you will find in our paper shortly. The next case study that you will find is Kokopaka Reserve. This is not looking at, a, at, a, at an existing or traditional typology, but rather it's looking at a, um, at a crafting practice. It's taking inspiration from traditional uh, crafting of uh, baskets that were, that were made to fish for eels by the indigenous people of Aotearoa. So these forms um, incorporated in the landscape and the way it is laid out is responding to the process of crafting a basket. Um, and it is combining traditional design philosophies and crafting practices in urban design from an eel basket to an urban wetland. Um, again, the, the materials that are being used are very different. The scale is very different. Uh, the use of the two are very, very different, but it is a continuation of a traditional practice within the built environment. That's what's really important for us. Um, there are many, many other projects uh, worthy of recognition in, in the country. And I, I really hope that more people, more of my colleagues and more people from New Zealand would, would share our architecture um, internationally so that we can have productive discussions about how things are going and also so that the, the beauty of the architecture of New Zealand can be um, shared with the international community. Uh, thank you so much for having me today. Have a good day.